Right, steaming on. Uh, we are very lucky to welcome uh, Dave Atkinson, CEO of Senson. And Dave, it's over to you for some insights into how you're using AI in the context of cybersecurity. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Dave. Uh, Chris, appreciate it. Um, well, good evening, everyone. As uh, Chris has mentioned, I'm the CEO of Senson. Uh, Senson is an advanced security operations platform. We integrate with existing uh, architectures, and we use AI to restore trust and confidence in those architectures. And um, I couldn't help um, but be struck when looking and thinking about, you know, AI, is it dystopia or utopia? Quite similar to the question that we had. You know, what lessons could we draw from history, you know? And, you know, similar to when we split the atom and physicists around the world, the potential impact of that scientific breakthrough was potentially the breakthrough that we had with maybe ChatGBT 3.5 or 4, a similar one, and actually the duality of the breakthrough and how we actually must pursue this to its uh, conclusion to actually really fully understand the impact and the implications of AI is something that also struck me when I was thinking about this talk. Um, I will make a case over the next 15 minutes that actually cybersecurity really sits at the core of that and is a real key linchpin to both us realize the potential utopia and hopefully avoid the potential dystopia uh, of AI. And then I'm going to be really open and transparent with some real world data of how we've also experienced uh, the duality of AI as how we thought when we're doing a really good thing of trying to reduce noise and increase accuracy and alerts, how that can actually have a potential impact uh, as well. So um, <clears throat> what I'm going to talk about, obviously, is starting with the duality. We've heard a little bit of this uh, already. You know, uh, Clearly, every good thing about speeding up the vaccination to coronavirus being a good thing, but of course, the flip side of that is potentially creation of new biological weapons. The ability to detect um, cancer, the ability to detect uh, uh, certain defects with eyesight are being used widely now to great effect. Clearly a huge benefit. And of course, climate change, one of humanity's biggest challenges that we face, the use of AI is having a huge impact there as well. And of course, this comes with downsides. I don't know if anyone saw this article, but it was released about a week ago where uh, the sort of fintech firm Klarna had developed a chatbot. And the interesting data from the chatbot was actually it resolved customers' queries much faster and to a higher degree of satisfaction. And actually, the cases that the AI resolved were much less likely, 23% less likely, to be reopened again. Um, and they estimate that it's going to save them 40 million pounds. Uh, and of course, job displacement is obviously one of the potential downsides of AI. And I think this is actually some of the hardest data that I've seen in a real world situation uh, that talks to that point. Clearly, privacy is a concern when you can begin to pick pieces of data out across vast data sets and connect them together. That is going to have some uh, negative impacts. Uh, and of course, this year is one of the most significant years for democracy in the Western world. We've got elections in the US, we've got elections in many countries across Europe. Clearly, the 2016 interference into the US elections uh, 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 was being uh, highlighted by this poster. But hey, what does that look like in an age where content could be produced at a huge scale? You know, what impact did that potentially have? Um, does anyone know who this is, this pleasant-looking chap? Anyone see this video of the last week? Yeah. Okay, so this is a robot called Figure One. If you haven't seen it yet, I'm going to introduce you to some of its uh, capabilities in a few slides' time. But when we begin putting robots into our homes, you know, it's not a, a massive uh, leap uh, to uh, imagine back for those who remember uh, the movie uh, Terminator, and therefore we must secure this type of stuff, right? You know, it's not uh, too far of an imagination when someone flips the switch and turns Mr. Nice Happy Robot into Mr. Not So Nice uh, Robot. So, um, so I really do believe cybersecurity is a critical AI battleground. Not only does AI itself need to be secure, but of course we work hard in applying AI to protect businesses uh, all over the world. And there's a number of strategic mega trends that's making this all the more difficult, and it makes it perfect that AI has turned up 
when it has. Um, firstly, it's the complexity of the landscapes that we're dealing with. You can track this back to the advent, really, of the huge hyperscaler public cloud providers. We instead no longer have a castle and moat. We actually have an archipelago of many data islands to protect each with its own unique challenges. And the threat is evolving at a pace that you know, we've never seen before. They've made lots of money. They can invest that money into R&D, as you would do if you were running any sensible business as they do. So they're coming up with new tactics and techniques. The sheer amount of data, something that AI can really help us out with, it's increasing exponentially. To give you a bit of a mental model for this, by 2025, 181 zettabytes. If one byte equaled one grain of rice, you could fill the Pacific Ocean with one zettabyte. So that gives you an idea of the size and scale when it comes to detection and response that we're trying to deal with. And then finally, talent shortage, okay? It's very hard to get people into cybersecurity, and so therefore, what can we do to help and support uh, that problem? There really is three core components uh, that our security operations team have got to wrestle with when thinking about securing their environments. The first one is data. If you collect lots of data, that's good, because you've got good coverage in the first instance, but it can be quite expensive. If you then have lots of analytics running over the data, again, that's good, because you can detect more threats. However, the problem is the final bit, and that's the alerts coming out of the system. And the alerts, if you've got too much analytics, can often overwhelm the security team. And so what that means is trust and confidence drops off, and so therefore they don't know what alerts are real and what ones to pay attention to. And that's essentially the world that we live in. Uh, and that's when I founded the company is where uh, the problem that I wanted to solve. And to solve the problem, I want to take you back to the first clip. I actually took some inspiration also from the nuclear industry. And actually, I want to lift you all out of this wonderful university, and I want to take you about 3,200 miles to the east. Um, I'm also going to take you back in time to the 23rd of September, 1983. It's 3 a.m. in the morning, and you're now all sat in the operations room of the R Russian Nuclear Missile Defense Center. It stinks of cigarettes and coffee. There's people that are nodding off. You've been sat here for months and months, staring at the same screens. Nothing's really changed. It's quite a boring job, actually. But all of a sudden, the screens begin to flash red, and the alarms begin to go off. You're frozen in your chair. You've never seen it before. But you know what this means is that the US have launched a preemptive nuclear strike towards Russia. You also know that your only job in this scenario is to get up, walk across the room, pick up the phone so that you could inform your superiors that an attack has been launched towards Russia. Four more alarms go off, meaning five nuclear missiles are winging their way towards Russia. You get up off your chair, you walk across the room, you pick up the phone. It's answered immediately. You then utter the words that will define the fate of humanity you say, the early warning system has malfunctioned. Your name is Colonel Stanislav Petrov, and you have just literally saved humanity. What actually happened that evening, this is a true story, was a rare alignment of high-altitude clouds over North Dakota, combined with how the sunlight was reflecting on them, tricked this early warning system into thinking that uh, five nuclear missiles were launched towards Russia. Now, ever since that day, what must happen when a specific missile launch is detected by a single satellite, it must be triangulated by multiple other satellites in order to confirm the trust and the confidence of that initial detection. This is exactly what we do for our customers by triangulating and using AI to triangulate all of these many, many alerts in their environment. And this is the results that we get. And so I'm going to introduce you to one of our customers. It's a FTSE 100 customer. It's located 100 locations across the globe, um, and it's around about 10,000 people. The situation when they came to us was they had an outsourced managed security provider that was chucking loads and loads of alerts across the fence. They had certain tools, again, that they were getting loads and loads of alerts, but it was taking them sometimes over a day to investigate these alerts. 
Um, and so we installed our system, and uh, we are deployed and detecting around about 8,000 different hosts in their environment, around 81,000 different uh, identities. Um, and this is where AI begins to play a role. So over the last 30 days, you get almost 22 billion signals detected in that environment. Around 13,000 of these alerts are automatically triangulated to produce just 71 cases and a 16 minutes mean time to respond. So going from taking it over a day to investigate, the AI is able to triangulate these alerts and provide the context, the enrichment, and the advice to conduct the investigation that it now only takes them 16 minutes. So talking about the duality of AI, can anyone think of the, a problem with this? <laughs> Okay, well, if it's an eight minutes to investigate a single case and you're only getting 71, so about two cases a day, similar problem to what we saw at Klarna, right? If you're an analyst, all of a sudden, that means the 40 hours that you're paid to work a week over the course of the month, that's only now 5% of your time that you're spending <laughs> investigating actual alerts. And so one of the problems that we've experienced is then how do you then use AI to actually help and support our customers and our analysts in terms of what they do because, you know, it's not a particularly attractive screen to be staring at and be like, oh, great, no news. No refreshes, no news. And so trust and confidence becomes really, really important. And you've got to be confident in the system that it's going to actually tell you when something genuinely bad is going on. And so this is an example of a purple team exercise where whereby you get uh, red team hackers to break into the organization, and the blue team try to detect and um, uh, understand the early signals of those types of attacks. And so using the system to train users when they're not actively investigating things by running simulations is certainly one of the things that we find whereby we can collaborate uh, with uh, those analysts with lots of free time now on their hand. And it's a partnership, because sometimes, in this particular case, um, we also get it wrong, and it's probably something you can't quite see the timestamp here, but this is half seven in the evening. This is a, a, a global a chemical manufacturer. And what you begin to see is actually, okay, the end user clicked to update Google Chrome browser, ticket close, no worries, I'm off to bed. Um, but actually in this case, it was wrong. It was actually the AI then that said when they close the ticket, hold on a minute, actually, you might want to relook at this again. And actually, you're right, it was someone downloading <laughs> Chrome, but only this time uh, they downloaded a malicious JavaScript file, which then infected the machine, which went to discover some remote shares, um, and then used a malicious program. And even detecting the fact that when the threat actor had fingers on keyboard, they were mistyping things into the command prompt. And so, this idea of the duality of AI whereby, yes, it can sometimes um, uh, be a downside whereby you uh, all of a sudden have got a lot of free time on your hands, but when it counts, that ability to work in partnership uh, it becomes critically uh, important. So check this guy out. Hey, figure one, what do you see right now? I see a red apple on a plate in the center of the table, a drying rack with cups and a plate, and you standing nearby with your hand on the table. Pretty cool. You should check out the whole video. Um, it really is amazing just how quickly that we've advanced in this space in such a short uh, space of time. I think, you know, a lot of this has been discussed already. Um, there's a huge opportunity here, but there is uh, undoubtedly some potential for lots of things uh, to go wrong. I think protecting any digital space is about maintaining trust and integrity. It's been talked about a lot, you know, uh, tonight, how important trust is in our digital interactions. It requires collaboration across borders, government and sectors, and of course, it needs to be protected itself because we don't want this guy turning into our not so nice uh, cousin. And I'll leave you with this thought. This story that I told you about Colonel Petrov is absolutely true. There's a Netflix documentary on it, The Man Who Saved the World. You can look that up when you go home. Um, the first early warning system was launched in 1963. So 
it took about 20 years for them to like improve the system enough that maybe we should do some triangulation. The only thought I'll leave you with is this was one of the quickest, well, it was the quickest adoption of a platform to get to 100 million users ever. I think fundamentally the jury is out and it's too early to say what the potential impact is. But for me, for now, I'm an AI optimist and I'm very, very hopeful of the future. Thanks. Thank you, Dave. Uh, definitely time for a couple of questions. Yes, we have one questioner. Hello. Uh, my name's Chris Bounds. I've got a question about um, your opinion on accountability with AI specifically. Great um, people, like humans, us, when there's an issue, we can blame it on somebody. <laughs> I mean, people can be punished and go to prison, maybe. Um, I mean, what, what do you do with AI? Yeah. Are we going to make AI jails, or do we have some yeah. kind of actual sensible way to, to deal with this? The for AI, yeah. Um, it's a bit of a design problem that we've been struggling with from the start. And actually, before we had, um, when we first launched the product, people would be like, it's, it's not working. You know, like I said, nothing's happening. And so what we then introduced was a feature called experience, which is a database where all of the things that the AI has seen and looks back on and makes decisions about, as in, does it downscore some versus the other? We make that open and transparent. And to me, it comes down to trust, you know? So, if you're a bit of a geek, trust can actually be quantified. There's a thing called the trust equation, which is basically credibility multiplied by reliability multiplied by intimacy, maybe question mark for AI, divided by self-orientation, you know? And so I guess it's all about, you know, taking people on a journey to the adoption uh, of AI. And you've got to allow them to confirm that it is both credible and reliable to deliver that trust, you know? So it's a, it takes a bit of time. Question. Um, anybody else, quickly, before we move on to our next speaker? No, you've got off lightly, Dave. Uh, Sense on fantastic company, just gone through successful Series A, mm -hmm. are hiring big time. Yeah, They're yeah. London, yeah, yeah, yeah. London, uh, but with a genesis coming out of Charlton and definitely connections back here. So thank you so much for your time, Dave. Wonderful. Thank you.